Hello and welcome to Cruise 5. My guest today is Vusi Tembekwayo. He's a South African entrepreneur, a global keynote speaker, and a venture capitalist. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Squire. Thank you for having me. Where exactly in South Africa do you come from? I come from the heart of Gauteng in Joburg. I come Gauteng? From, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I come from a... I grew up in the East Rand part of Gauteng, which is a, like a small mining town yes. called Watville, Benoni, mm -hmm. and I now live in the northern, more affluent suburbs. Aha, uh -huh. more affluent, because I guess you are more affluent now, but <laughs> tell me about you growing up, because I don't think you grew up as a, a very affluent person and in an affluent neighborhood, I guess. No, no, no. I come from a, um, uh, geez, uh, I, definitely not middle class household. <laughs> I mean, we, we were, you know, we were m marginally below middle class. My, my father died when I was... 13 years old oh, and uh, my father was gunned down and uh, my mother raised uh, five kids on a single mother's salary. So, gunned down? Yeah, so that has a big problem with crime. It was a problem certainly when I was growing up. It continues to be a problem today. So it's not a typical, and I don't speak poorly about my country. But yes, yes, yeah. This is something we really need to work on. It's, it's not atypical yeah. for, uh, for somebody to, to be murdered and it goes unsolved. What exactly happened? Was he coming from work or something? No, we were, we were, at, uh, we were at a family gathering. Yes. Uh, it was my grandmother's birthday and my father wanted to buy uh, some extra items. So he walked from where we were to, uh, um, it's like a, 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 a block with a series of shops in it. Yes. And there were some, uh, some guys who saw him and they wanted to take his cell phone. Just like that? Yeah, so I've got to tell you, my father was a, a second degree black belt in martial arts. So I did martial arts for 13 years because my dad introduced me to the ah. sport. So they, they attacked him and tried to take his cell phone and he fought back. He fought back, yeah. And I suppose when they realized uh, they weren't going to get their way, they, yeah, nine times they shot him. Growing up with your mom, uh, how was it like? How was life like? Yeah, it was a tale of two. It was a tale of two cities, mm. a tale of two lives. It mm. was. I come from an incredible family. My mom is to this day my hero. Mm -hmm. Mom is my hero. Mom was a rock star. Mom made it work. I don't know how she did it. I mean, I really don't know how she put us through the school. She yes, put us through. Yeah. Made sure there was food on the table. I did extramural activities. So I was in martial arts. I I was in provincial athletics. I was in. I played uh, the violin to grade six level. I played wow. the piano. I was in the choir. My mom made all of that happen. I don't know how she did it. I really don't know. So there was, there was that, and we were we were pushed at home. So people, you don't understand my mentality now. It's just because I was raised. My my mother pushed us ruthlessly to be the best we could, and she told us every day we were capable, and she told us every day that our situation was not our destiny. Every day, my mom told us that. Your situation is not your destiny. You can get out of here. So there was that. And then there was also the, the very clear levels of, uh, of, of lack, um, of poverty around us, right? Um, was your mom working at this time? My mom worked all throughout. Yes. Uh, she worked all throughout. She kept a steady job. She worked hard. Mm -hmm. She pulled in the hours. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom worked all throughout. But uh, yeah, so, so, so as I say, tale of two lives. There was, there was the... The, the drive, the ambition, the desire to be more, the deep sense of family, uh, deep sense of, a deep sense of identity. I think if there's one thing my mother gave us was a very strong sense of identity, of personal w worth and wealth. Mm -hmm. But also the environment you were in was not conducive to, uh, to having those things. So she had to, to really give them to us through, ver through verbalizing it and through speech. Growing up and doing school i understand at some point things got a bit tough and uh you couldn't continue with, uh, with your education yeah so i, I kind of went through my, my what we call in south africa my pri primary schooling level yes to my year seven grade seven okay then i went into my high school which okay. was grade eight to grade 12 mm -hmm. finished and then of course you go to university yes and uh i went to university and uh, uh we didn't have funds to pay for me to go to varsity so the plan was go to varsity and um, get good marks and force the varsity to keep me. Except in South Africa, the university doesn't exercise positive discrimination. So whether you get good marks or not, the university can make a decision to keep you out of the university. Uh -huh. So I finished my first year and we hadn't paid my fees and uh, the university renounced my, uh, my education. And I oh my go goodness, back. and they kicked you out of school. Yeah. That must have been hard. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was, 
Uh, but also remember, you know, you have to understand the background I come from, right? Yes. So I don't come from the background where we wallow in pity. That's not who we are. So you were like, okay, this has happened. I have to move on. I've, I've got to make something out of this. Yeah, and, and my mother is not the kind of person who will let you wallow in pity. My mom is, take charge. Right? So, okay, so you can't go back for year two. Let's make a plan. What's next? And, um, you know, I, I went and found a job and I started working. And immediately when I started working, I took myself through school. Very first thing I did with my very first paycheck is I went and signed up at school, at a university, and I pursued my education part-time. So it's not, uh, it's, just, it's just how we were raised, right? I want to hear more about that. But before we get to that, let's talk music, because I, I do believe, are you a musical man? You say you, you, you learned to play the violin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so amazing. I, yeah, I mean, I have a, I have a very strange taste in, taste in music. I'll yes. go from listening to Giuseppe Tartini's uh, fourth movement, uh, and then I'll listen to Jay-Z, uh, well, that's what I call a musical man, because I mean, you have to appreciate <laughs> music in every, in every form that it comes. Sure, because music is expression, right? And yes. If you, if you really want to understand times and spaces, mm -hmm. one of the best ways to really get into a certain time and a space and understand the context of that time and history as we have it, is to understand the music that, was, that permeated at that time. Any favorite type of music that... Um yeah, it depends. I love jazz. No. I mean, I, I suppose it's because I'm getting older now. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, appreciating, I'm appreciating jazz. I'm appreciating uh, music that is about um, discovery. Okay. Right? Now, there's a different types of music, but jazz is really about discovery. And the reason jazz is about discovery is because the artist plays what he plays. The interpretation of what the artist plays is, is, for, is for the consumer of that music. Mm -hmm. So you go through a process of discovery, of relation with the music. Right? And it's... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have several artists at the moment who are just consistently on my two playlists. Mm -hmm. um, and then it depends. If, I, if I'm at the gym, uh, I know I'll definitely switch to some you, you switch to something, or something else. Yeah, fresher. Yeah. 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 Let's listen to the first song in Cruise 5 today. What is it going to be? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> it should be hard to choose for someone who listens to all that kind of music. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would have to start with Gregory Porter. Okay. First, if I may just tell you a quick story. Yes, please. So, um, a friend of mine lives in London, okay. and about two, no, no, less, yeah, about two years ago, he invites me over to his, he invites me over to his apartment in London. Yes. And uh, it, was a, it was a Friday evening, I was there over in some business, mm -hmm. and in fact, I was over in school, and he invites me, uh, he says, a Friday evening, you know, yeah. just, just come over. pop in for, uh, for dinner. A drink. Okay. What's, the, what's, the, what's the dress, uh, dress code? He says, uh, smart casual. Okay. You know, so I arrive and there's a, must have been a group of about 18 of us and we're having dinner. Mm -hmm. And halfway through the dinner, so he serves um, uh, a set of the appetizers, then serves starters. We're, we're right in the middle of the main course. And we're sitting in this beautiful apartment yeah. on, on, on the Canary Wharf. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful apartment. Canary Wharf is fantastic. And, and his, uh, his apartment has the... So he's right at the top, and he's got this beautiful panoramic view of the city. View, so you walk yes. out to the balcony, and you can see the entire panoramic wow. view of, of, East, of, uh, of uh, West London. Just beautiful. Yeah. So uh, we're sitting, and we're eating um, our dinner, and knock on the door, and then walks in Gregory Porter. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my I, goodness. I've also got to tell you, my, the same friend in his home has got this beautiful grand piano, this beautiful <laughs> Yamaha grand piano. This is unbelievable. Yeah. So Greg Porter walks in, and Greg kind of greets and sits down at the piano, and, this one and he just starts playing. Oh, my wow. goodness. Now, I know who Greg Porter is. Right? Yes, so, yes, so I, yes. I go Google Gaga. You, you, you can't believe it. But, I, but I'm also consistent with where I'm at. I know I can't go and ask him for like an autograph. I'm be like, <laughs> can we take a selfie? <laughs> it's like, it's, Right, he's like, can we do this thing? Is he? Yeah, he just comes in, he's yeah, got his I mean, hat, like, he's got his headscarf, he yes. sits down and he starts playing. And uh, the very first song he played, uh, which, is, which is the one I'll tell you about, was Water Under Bridges. Water Under Bridges. Yeah. Great Reporter, Water Under Bridges. Let's check it out. Great Reporter, Water Under Bridges. That's the choice of our guest today in Cruise 5, Vusi Tembequayo. South African entrepreneur, he is a global keynote speaker, and he is a venture capitalist. We're getting to know more about that soon, but finding a job after you've only done one year of varsity, that wasn't easy at all, was it? I had an asset, and my asset was that I uh, was well-spoken, and uh, my ability, I suppose, to speak 
uh, got people to notice. And I, I was lucky. The truth is I was lucky. A yeah. friend of mine who, uh, a fellow at the time who was a friend of mine, was trying to organize a meeting with a director of a bank that I knew. Okay. Uh, because I'd won the, the South African Public Speaking Championship. Oh, you did? And this specific bank had sponsored the competition. Tell me more about the South African uh, Public Speaking Competition. Well, I, so I won the... So my, my, I'm a, how do I put this? I'm a classically trained public speaker. Okay. So th there are some people who speak. Yes. That's not what I do. I'm a classically trained public speaker. It's how like, do you do that? Well, it's like the difference between... Um, it's like the difference between somebody who plays piano at church okay. and Beethoven. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's worlds apart. So I, I come from a classical stream where I was trained in public speaking for uh -huh. about 10 years. But four years into my training, I, I won the South African Championship, then the African Championship, okay. then the World Championship. Wow. And then again, about four years later, I won the World Championship and set the five-minute record in the five... In the, in the five-minute competition format of public speaking. My world record still stands. So my, my training, my classical training is in oratory. That's my training. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I win the, world, the first South African... Uh, so you, people knew you at this time. I mean... Yeah. You know, I, I, fairly. I, I was not... The, the point is that I was not without network. Yes. And that's all you need, right? I mean, exactly. When, you know, when you're young and you are looking for opportunities, that's all you need. You mm -hmm. just need a network. Someone who knows someone who knows someone. This is it. Mm -hmm. So I knew the guy, mm -hmm. and um, a friend needed to organize a meeting with him. So okay. I went and had helped them organize the meeting. And then um, that friend was organizing a meeting for the CEO of a company. Mm -hmm. And the CEO met me and liked me. And uh, it was exactly the same time, you know, I wasn't able to go to school. I was looking for a job. And he said, come and join. Come be part of our sales. He said to me, he looked at me and he said, you're well spoken. Come and join my sales team. I thought, mm. well, I'm not sure what sales is. But yeah, but I'll try it. Yeah, I'll learn. It can't hurt. And that was my very first job. So you never went back to school? Oh, but I did. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I how did. did that work out? A job I and then part school? Time. Okay. part time. I, I have to tell you, I, I have, I place an incredible amount of value in education. Yes. So, you know, today I'm educated to my master's now. I've just made an application to pursue my PhD. I've been mm -hmm. accepted to pursue my PhD wow. at the foremost academic institution in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So for me, education is critical. But I've pursued almost all my education in tandem with developing a career. Um, so Some, yeah. I mean, traditionally, in Africa, most people would want to do education first and then they they pursue their career after that sure didn't you find it a bit challenging to manage the two at once yeah, sure but i mean you you are a subject you you are you are the result of your circumstances and your decisions mm -hmm. so would i have preferred i would have preferred to go to university finish and uni and then do yeah, and then do work. I, you know i also wanted to go to the dorm parties mm -hmm. you know i wanted to be at the dormitory parties i yes. wanted to be at the springfield bashes mm -hmm. i wanted to to get lost in the university experience, to be in sports and yeah. to go through two months of holidays. Yeah. My life didn't work out that way. What I am grateful for is very early on in my life, mm -hmm. it gave me a sense of discipline mm -hmm. and gave me a sense of, of commitment. So, you know, people look at me today and say, you're 32, you've achieved more than most people achieve at 80. Exactly. Sure. But that's also because I work 10 times as more than the average the, person. Yeah. I started earlier mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm bright. So, you know, you put together hard work, time in the game and intellectual ability and you're going to get good results. Growing up as a, a young little Vusi somewhere in Gauteng, what did you always want to become? And did, is that what it turned out to be? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so first you have to understand the context of South Africa. Yes. I'm born in 1985. Mm -hmm. Apartheid ended in 1990. Yes. So I was born into the apartheid, apartheid system. Apartheid Africa, yeah. Uh, when I was born, Nelson Mandela was in prison, right? mm -hmm. just to give you a sense. Yes. So I'm born into a life constructed for black people by white people. Yes. And what that life did quite specifically is it, dis it, did, it had a system, a social system that sought to keep the black majority repressed, uneducated, and unemployable. That's what the system of apartheid was. Mm -hmm. So you take 88% of the population in the country, which is black African, you give them bad quality of education, 
And if you do that, you can provide cheap labor to the factories which the white people own. That's what the system of apartheid was. Apartheid was not a system of anything more than economic domination. Mm -hmm. right? So that's what I'm born into. Okay. So growing up, where I grew up, hmm. there weren't any role models and examples. You didn't aspire to become anything at well, all. Because there was nothing to aspire to be. I mean, it, I, I, if, if I aspired to be a professional, a professional when I grew up was a teacher. Yeah. Or a nurse. That's the highest you could go, that you could think of. Or a policeman. Um, and then many years later, maybe a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But even then you knew about a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what an advocate was. Yes. If you wanted to, you, you, wanted, you maybe wanted to be a bookkeeper. You didn't know what a chartered accountant was. See? Um, you maybe wanted to be a bank teller. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what an investment banker was. Mm -hmm. You get it? So, yeah. so there, were, there, were, there, were, there, were, there was, there was a, a clear and deliberate system that limited your horizons. You couldn't lift your eyes beyond it because around you there was no role modeling. It's a, something I take very personally today is make yes. sure that I role model to young people yes. so that they know it's possible. Exactly. So growing up, I wanted to be all sorts of things. I wanted to be a doctor. It was really just the next person you see and you're like, that looks cool. Yeah, we had a, a I want to be like that. We had a phenomenal family doctor. It was an Indian fellow. So I thought, I definitely I think want to do good. that. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then one day my, my sister was sick and we took her to the doctor. She was vomiting. And then she went into the doctor's office and I thought, I don't want to handle people's vomit. <laughs> so, so they went the dream of, <laughs> they went the dream of being a doctor. Um, I wanted to become a lawyer and then I, 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 I learned that lawyers get paid per hour and that the rate was actually really, really small. I was like, no. I There's no way make... I'm getting that per hour. I'm like, no. Nah, I need, I I need to... something that gives me loads of money. Yeah, and also then you know, had to go through like legal books this big. Yeah, and construct I mean, oh arguments. no, it's, it's, it's a nightmare studying for law I mean it's like, no, no <laughs> too no. much work no 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 really it's it's okay um, so deciding to get into what you eventually got into that that must have been quite daring because I mean it must have been something that you probably didn't even think you would do at all yeah my life my life is a function of coincidence and deliberateness mm -hmm. so so the truth is at the beginning of you know Steve Jobs says in life you can only connect the dots backwards Okay. So when you look forward, as what, what seems like a random set of events, when you look backwards, actually it's it, logical. It makes sense. Go, oh, yeah, it that makes should sense. have happened for this. Life, my life kind of worked out the same way. So uh -huh. I didn't go, I want to be a venture capitalist. Yes. I, mean, I didn't. Yeah. But I started my first business. Mm -hmm. I needed financial assistance, mm -hmm. and there was nobody there to help me. Yes. So many years later, when I'd made money, I went, yeah, that's something I should fix. Oh, it turns out it's called venture capital. I'll do I'm, that. I'm, whatever it's called. I mean, right. I, I, this is what I want to do. Exactly right. Um, so, so I get into this business. I'm in sales. And I was, you know, I was selling. This, this was a, a large IT company selling very complex digital solutions. Very complex stuff. They were doing Internet of, Internet of Things in 2003, 2004. So this is before people knew what the internet was. Yes. In, 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 in truth. Yes. And we were doing connectivity of sensors of devices and organizations to allow for streamlining of processes. In 04, 05, you've got to be daring to do this stuff. Exactly. So uh, one day a fellow walked in. We were pitching something to him. My CEO was supposed to be in the meeting. The CEO never came to the meeting. Yeah. And uh, I was asked to go and pitch to the guy. Went and pitched to him. The company never got the deal. But the guy I was pitching to was running a treasury function of one of the large industrial listed companies in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And he phoned me about two days later and said, let's have a coffee. And he offered me a job. And I went from selling IT solutions to becoming part of a complex financial business wow. and selling financial arrangements internally into the, into the group. A huge leap. Massive leap. Vusi Tembekwai, my guest today in Cruise 5, what's our next song going to be? Um, it would have to be Amel LaRue. Amel LaRue. Get up. Get up. Get up. I mean, that, that should be a message to the viewer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sit. Don't sit on your butt. Just get up and go. All right. I'm Eli Rowe. Venture capitalist. Yes. What is that? Um, I mean, you starting off, you never knew that's what it was called. To you, it's just, okay, let me do this. Maybe, maybe, let me put it to you this way. Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain it so that the, the viewer watching at home understands it. Every person that works earns an income, a part of that income gets taken for their retirement, it's called a pension. Mm -hmm. And around the world, the largest investors are known as pension funds. They yes. control trillions of dollars in capital. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they take people's money who are, who are going to retire, and they invest it in a set of financial instruments for what this thing called capital preservation. Mm -hmm. 
Because remember, every year there is inflation. So the cost of a can of baked beans today is different to the cost of a can of baked beans 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking your pension and putting it in your mattress, you're losing money. Because it won't buy you the same, excuse me, same value of stuff 10 years from now. So pension funds take money and invest it for you to preserve your wealth. We know that to be what is called classical investment environment. Mm -hmm. The difference mm -hmm. is this thing called alternative investments. Yes. These are often unlisted equities typically. Mm -hmm. So this is, you have a large factory mm -hmm. or your family has owned a business for, uh, I don't know, 40 years mm -hmm. and you have two factories that make water and mm -hmm. you want to build a third factory mm -hmm. and you need some funding. The bank won't fund you, but there are a group of people mm -hmm. who together have enough money to fund you and they will put the money in. Okay. These are private individuals who mm -hmm. provide you with equity finance. Mm -hmm. That's where the term private equity comes mm -hmm. from. Okay. Now, private equity typically is for businesses that have been running for a long time with steady cash flows. The antithesis of private equity is businesses that have been running for a shorter period of time with erratic cash flows, mm -hmm. the risk is higher. Mm -hmm. And developed all over the world was this concept of people who would take their capital to back the venture, a venture capitalist. Uh -huh. So those are the three tiers. Uh -huh. it's, it's classic listing, classic investments, everybody mm -hmm. knows about it. Yeah. And then in the alternative space is private equity mm -hmm. and venture capital. And venture capital in essence, people like myself take our money and we take bets on entrepreneurs to build businesses and uh, to, to, to create wealth. So, are you employed or you're doing something of your own? Today? Yes. No, I mean, I'm CEO of two separate businesses. The first mm -hmm. is Iconoclast, which is our knowledge bureau. And I run out, we, we believe that, that knowledge is the single most important thing Africa needs today. The problem Definitely. with Africa is that Africans don't know. So there is a massive information asymmetry, you know. For instance, I, you know, most of the people watching this would not have heard about alternative investments before. Uh, most, I know, I know entrepreneurs have been running businesses for 40 years, they don't know what weighted average cost of capital is. Yes. And so the problem with knowledge is when you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't do what you should do because you don't know. Right. So we have to, we have to tackle this, this knowledge asymmetry issue. And how we do it is by providing knowledge capital to the world. So our Iconoclast business does a lot of research. And we take that research and we publish it to inform people so that they know. We produced, for instance, an article on the decline of Nakumat before Nakumat declined. Wow. We, f we foresaw it. Six months ago, we called it. We called what was going to happen to Nakumat in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And as you know, about four months after we called it, uh, the first issue started surfacing around Nakumat, and now, of course, the business has gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. When we first started calling it, everybody said we were crazy, but we were running the data behind the scenes, so we knew what was happening. We knew what, what was going so anyway, on. I'm CEO of the Connor class business, and then, of course, I'm CEO of my venture capital fund, which okay. is called My Growth Fund. Uh, we're a pan-African youth-based fund. So we are domiciled in South Africa, licensed in Kenya, Nigeria. So we, we think about Africa as the, con as the three triangles, sort of yeah. connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. And we finance businesses that have a heavy focus on developing youth. Okay. So are they youth as talent, youth as skill, youth as management, or even youth as part of the ownership structure of that business? Uh, because, and I just want to make this final point, Africa has an interesting problem. Mm -hmm. In its 1.2 billion number of citizens, 62% uh, of them are young people. Yes. But in other parts of the world, young people are in the productive economy. They exactly. work, they have jobs. Yes. Uh, young people have energy, they have time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In Africa, that's not the case. Yeah. Typically, young people are unemployed. In my country, for instance, the unemployment rate is 40%. Mm -hmm. For young people between the ages of 16 and 35, the unemployment rate is north of 50%. Exactly. So half of our youth capacity isn't employed. Yes. The problem with young people unemployed is first they don't acquire skills, which means in future they become unemployable, mm -hmm. which is a real problem for governments. Yeah. And the second problem, which is the more burning issue, is young people have energy, they have fever. So if you don't make them productive, they find other things to do. They get into crime, yes. uh, they, be they, they, they become a s a social pariahs. So we focus as a fund on making sure that we drive youth inclusion into the mainstream economy. It's for us one of our term sheet mandates. We invest in your firm. We need a clear plan of how you're going to help develop young, young people, people in your firm. Absolutely. Whose problem is it that young people are not taking advantage of the opportunities that are there or that Africa is not making the most of this very productive age group? 
No, it's, 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 it's ironic. It's not, the, the question, with, with respect, your question is fallacious. It's not that young people aren't taking advantage of the opportunities. It's that old people are hogging the opportunities. See, the problem with Africa that we have... I would, I would argue that the, the opportunities, they won't be presented to them. I mean, you have to fight. You, no, have, to, you have to go no, and get them. No. Tell that to the young person growing up in Nigeria today with one of the, one of the most corrupt societies. What opportunities? Where does he go? What network? Just think about it. You live in an economy, look at Nigeria. You live in an economy that is predominantly based on a single commodity oil, and all, all the oil extractors and exporters are businesses that are run by people in their 50s and 60s who are not in the habit of trying to transform those businesses for young people. So if you're a young person growing up in, in, in Nigeria, what can you hope to do? You can hope to maybe but take water from one end and sell it to another. That's what you can hope to do. But you can't hope to become part of a large industrial development complex in Nigeria. It's true in Nigeria. It's true in South Africa. You know what's happening in my country? Uh, typically, older people who are politically connected are amassing huge unearned wealth. Young people who are coming up poorer without opportunities are not given the opportunity. So, so I take your point, but we, we have to be careful to stigmatize. Just give me a, a second. Yes. We have to be careful to stigmatize young people. I don't read the African problem as youth laziness. I read the African problem as, as old people who are stuck in old ways and who do not want to rethink and reconstruct our societies. That's the problem we have. Do you see the old people, for example, giving the platform to young people willingly because they also want the privilege that they enjoy through what they do. So it's not something that they just give freely. I mean, if the young people want to get where the old people are, they have to fight for it. They have to... I agree, I agree with you, but you know, you're right. Mm -hmm. But here's my point. I'm happy to fight for opportunities, but like a fighter, I must be told where the ring is and I must show up. Mm -hmm. If I don't even know there is a fight happening, how do I show up to the fight? Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. So if I'm a young person and I, let's imagine, want to supply water to a government department, but the government is cash gating mm -hmm. and the money leaves the government department long before it buys the water, I can't be blamed as a young person for not maximizing the opportunity. I didn't even know the opportunity existed. So we, if, if there were opportunities, Europe has a, a youth problem, but Europe's problem is youth maximizing opportunity. Mm -hmm. Africa's problem is youth being given opportunity. And the, the opportunities the are not there at all. They're not there. The, the, the purveyors and owners of our economies, the purveyors and owners of African wealth, continue to be the same people who do not want to share in the prosperity of the continent because their thinking is zero-sum game. Their thinking is, if there are two glasses of water on this table and I share mine with you, that only leaves me with one. They're not thinking, how do we take the glasses on this table and multiply it? But my question is, how will we break the vicious cycle? Because this will mm. keep going on. Mm. This, it's, it's a dog, it dog world out there. Everybody wants the best for themselves and nobody's going to give an inch of their yard to, to somebody. You know, in, in, in South Africa, we have this beautiful word. It's a Zulu word called Ubuntu. Ubuntu. And well, Ubuntu, we have Ubuntu here. Yeah, and Ubuntu it's, means... It's the same philosophy. Ubuntu means I am because you are, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the Europeans... Uh, talk about I think therefore I am. So mm -hmm. for the Europeans your ability to think translates into your identity. For the African my community is my identity. This is it. Yes. We're a communal people. Exactly. So to answer your question I have faith in the young people of this continent. Mm -hmm. You know I was in Sweden, Norway and Finland two weeks ago talking to global investors who are, in, who are investing in our fund and I said to them give us your money but understand you're investing in the future of the continent. Don't call me in five years time and ask me for this money back. Call me in 20. I'm investing in the future of this continent. I have faith in the young people of this continent. But I know this, and this is the message to the older generations that are, that are gatekeeping and locking opportunities to young people. Yeah. Follow the story of every single generation that has locked a youth population out of opportunities. And see if they made every it. Every time, that generation will lose. Mm -hmm. Hosni Mubarak did it in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Young people overthrew him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, good luck. Jonathan did it in Nigeria. No. Young people voted him out. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Jacob Zuma's doing it in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Young people are kicking him out. Mm -hmm. Every single leader who, who gatekeeps and locks opportunities for young people 
the young people will take you out of the system, either constitutionally or another means, but you will be out of the system. You'll be kicked down. <laughs> Not something that you really want to happen to you, but something that I really want to see happening is us watching the next song that you're going to choose. The third song, what is it going to be? Um, you know, there was a phenomenal Afro hip-hop group in South Africa called Squatter Camp. Oh, my God. And these guys trailblazed. I remember the very first time I started traveling overseas, yes. mid-2000s. I would like land in Perth and I'd be listening to these guys with my little, Where you know. Where did they go? I don't know. They kind of split and went, and went in their different directions. They were but, great. But they had, a, they had a song called Umoya. Yes. And for me, that's how I think about the generation of young people we what have today. What does the song say? Umoya. Umo, uzoz Umoya. It's like you'll feel... Umoya is air, but, yes. it, but it translates to um, a force. Okay. So when I say Uzoz Umoya, it's uh -huh. like you're going to feel this force coming. Uh -huh. And so the song is talking about how... There are forces that are shaping our societies and our communities. And whether you like it or not, you're going to feel it. And I kind of feel like that's exactly the message we need to be sending to, to the older generation. And that's squatter camp for you. Umoya. Uzozo Umoya. Busi Tembewayo is our guest today in Cruise 5. He is from South Africa, but he is a global keynote speaker, a venture capitalist, and he's also an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, you make many decisions. I'm curious to know if you have made some bad investment decisions in the past. All the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, the, the anomaly of leadership, and I wrote a beautiful piece actually, an article about this called, and it was an article on leadership. Yes. And it was called The Fallacy of Leadership. Mm -hmm. And it spoke about my experience being a leader and what the, what the literature says what leadership is yes. and what leadership is in reality. It's totally different. Very different. It? Literature says the leader knew what he was doing. Yeah. Reality, he didn't. You're just was, trying stuff out. He was trying stuff out. There was a bit of luck, a bit of opportunity, a bit of good fortune. The spark and... Uh, and then stuff happened. Yeah. L literature says the leader is strong as one man. In reality, he's scared. Yeah. He hopes he's doing he's the right thing. He's terrified and... Terrified he's getting it wrong. And he's, and he's scared of being lonely, right? Uh, the literature says... Yes. This leader made every decision yeah. and it was the perfect decision rubbish you was just you know the truth is leaders make more incorrect decisions than they make correct decisions mm -hmm. the power of leadership is two things mm -hmm. the first is when a leader makes a decision and he's and it's wrong he doesn't emotionally hang on to it he mm -hmm. changes his mind okay he will make a different decision mm -hmm. so this thing called the pivot but the second thing is when leaders make the right decision the quantum of good mm -hmm. defeats the, the, the loss of the bad on the wrong decisions. Okay. So I'll give you a, a, a sense in my example. Yes, please. In our firm, on an average of, we call it a portfolio play. So on yes. an average of seven investments, we'll lose money in five. So just to be clear. Yes. Five the two that The two that you make money in. Well, not both. Mm -hmm. So five, we're doing seven transactions. Yes. Five, I burn the money. It's yes. gone. Yeah. Of the two, one, I break even. It will yeah. return my money. Yes. Of the one where I make money, mm -hmm. it will pay for all the losses of the five uh -huh. and more. So what I've learned is not to get anxious about the five that we lose money on, uh -huh. but rather to, to care to find the one where we're going to make the, the, the quantum leap in growth. So, so to, that's just to answer your question. Yep. Do I make bad decisions? All the time. Do I call it wrong? All the time. I'm very comfortable in my skin and knowing that we're going to make poor decisions. We have a scientific process of making decisions and sometimes the process doesn't work. Okay. Well, so we don't get emotional. Mm -hmm. The minute we know, we cut the losses, we fix it, and we focus our energies on making good. Talk to the young man who wants to make it in life but doesn't have the wherewithal to make it. They don't have the money. They don't know anybody. Where can they start from? How can you... Fantastic question. Mm. You know, in our fund, we have a fund patron called Dr. Richard Maponya. If yes. you come to South Africa, mm -hmm. there's a beautiful mall in Soweto called Maponya Mall. It's mm -hmm. owned by Dr. Richard. Richard's story is in the heart of apartheid, in the heat of the 50s and 60s, yes. when black people weren't allowed economic enterprise, weren't allowed to own property. He was a black man who was building businesses and owning properties in the heart of apartheid. It was illegal, but he did it. He built an empire. So when, we, when I started building our fund, I needed a, a black role model 
whose life was an example to what we're doing. And, and Richard Maponya was a perfect match for us. But Richard Maponya has a philosophy, and the philosophy is correct. He says, Africa doesn't need an entrepreneurship revolution. We need a skills revolution. Okay. You see, well, we don't have the skills. Well, this is the point. Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is born of skills. Yes. So if you want to start a business uh, being a speaker, you need to have the skill of public speaking. Yes. You want to start a business uh, being a mechanic, you need the skill and you need, you need the ability. Yes. So what I would say to the young person who is without opportunity is to find a place where you can access the opportunity to acquire a skill. Place yourself in, a, in the right, be in the right place. This is it. Whether it's, whether it's volunteering to work at a mechanics workshop for three months just so you can learn how to fix cars, mm -hmm. how to change a battery, mm -hmm. and how to do all these things, do that because that's what will take you really, really far. Fourth song. I suppose as a tribute to my mother, yes. it would be uh, Boys to Men, a song for mama. You must be very attached to your mother. Yeah. Mom's, mom's my hero. Mom's my rock. Mom is, a, mom is a rock star. My mom is my best friend, my biggest supporter, and my most accurate critic. Is she competing with someone for that spot in your life in no. terms of a lady? No, 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 no. It's my Nobody mom. can replace mama. No, 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 no. So this song is for mama. And that's poised to me. Boosty Tembe Kwai, I've got a series of questions that I want to ask you just to know what you've been about, what you've been doing. Sure. You can only answer yes or no. Yes, okay. Do you want to play this game with yeah, me? Yeah, let's do All it. All right, let's do it. So, first I would like you to just tell me your full name. Vosi Tembe Kwai. Do you have any tattoos? Yes. Do you have any piercings? No. Do you have children? Yes. Have you ever shot a gun? Yes. Have you ever cried over someone? <laughs> oh dear yes all righty there we <laughs> have you fallen in love before yes have you killed a chicken before yes have you gotten into a fight before oh yes have you gotten any surgeries yes have you ever been hospitalized yes have you donated blood yes have you ever smoked weed <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> Next is, would you smoke weed? <laughs> Next after that. <laughs> Have you ever drunk alcohol? Yes. Have you ever broken someone's heart? Yes. Have you had a crush on someone? Yes. And there we end it. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank Pussy. you very much for having me. <laughs> what would be pleasure. your last song? Oh, wow. We've, we've kind of gone on a, on a sojourn. So there's a... One of my favorite movies in the world is Forrest Gump. Yes. Uh, run, Forrest, run, run, Forrest, run. And, uh, you know, one of the theme songs for that movie is by um, uh, Buffalo Springfield. Yes. And it's called For What It's Worth. Yes. And I love the song. The opening line is, there's something happening here. Mm -hmm. What it is ain't exactly clear. Mm -hmm. And the reason I love that song is because that's